Buonasera a tutti. Welcome. It is uh, fantastic to be here. I'm Mark Robbins, president of the American Academy in Rome. And uh, it is especially good to welcome you all back uh, to the Academy. This is the first exhibition that uh, we've done, uh, first spring exhibition that we've done since the beginning of the pandemic. And so this is a very hopeful time for us. Uh, the uh, title, Regeneration, and I'm sure the curators, uh, Lindsay Harris and Elizabeth Rodini, may have had this in mind, the notion of rebirth in a city that's famous for being destroyed, disinhabited, and re-inhabited. And uh, I, I do have to take a moment to recognize the uh, war in the Ukraine. Uh, this is... Uh, we think that in the rear view of uh, history that nothing like this uh, would happen again. And so we um, hope for a, a quick end and to aid to all of those who are suffering now. So just a, a moment about, about that. It may sound facile that, um, you know, art and artistic expression is is often what allows us to deal with that intersection between the personal and the political. And I think the work that you'll see after the exhibition does a remarkable job of talking about the complexity of what that actually means in very different artists' hands. So the work suggests alternative readings of value and order, and it critically reveals hidden or suppressed histories while proposing a simultaneity of meanings. And the diversity of work is really a testament to the ability to look at our, our environment, the world we live in today, through very different perspectives, all which question our received knowledge and our received wisdom about our own history and our future. So with that, I would, I'm very pleased to welcome our wonderful director, and co-curator uh, of the exhibition, Elizabeth Rodini. Elizabeth. Um, thank you, Mark, for those um, timely and, and really meaningful remarks. Um, the exhibition you will hear about and see tonight was conceived as part of our year dedicated to the theme of ethics. As an art historian and a scholar of cultural heritage, I've long been concerned with how the material survivals of the past shape what we know about ourselves, what we prioritize, and what, because of the fact of decay, but also because of the human inclination toward selective memory and willful oblivion, we forget. I've been particularly inspired by the writings of the scholar Caitlin de Silvi, who defines herself as a cultural geographer and whose work, precisely in the spirit of the American Academy, is richly multifaceted. In a poetic essay of 2006 about a ruined homestead in Montana that she had been sent to restore, de Silvi describes being moved by the natural processes she witnessed at the site old farm tools being overrun by a tangle of vines, a box of papers turned into some sort of found poetry by the mice who had nibbled the texts into piles of readable scraps. De Silvi offers lyrical observations about matter and its transformations, focusing her attention on change rather than the false icon of permanence. She interprets a ruin as a structure that is in process of revealing its interior, for example, or an object as, quote, a provisional gathering of matter on its way to becoming something else. Our exhibition, Regeneration, springs from these ideas. Together, Lindsay Harris and I engaged 11 artists and one artistic duo, either through their, who either through their processes or the things they represent, that is, quite literally or in metaphor, reveal degeneration to be a generative force. Rome is a natural place to explore these themes, but the artists included in the show represent five continents. They are Italian and non, 
Some have affiliations with the Academy and some are new to us. They are photographers, painters, sculptors, composers, landscape architects, installation artists, and filmmakers. This great mix is indicative of the broad relevance of the themes we consider. The literal force of matter is universal. What we do with that fact and how we deal with it is a matter of perspective and culture, but on a global scale, it is existential as well. I want to thank all of the participating artists, eight of whom are here tonight, for the stimulating conversations we have had and the powerful work they share. They include Fabio Barile, Chiara Camoni, Annalisa Metta and Luca Catalano, Sonia Clark, Bin Dan, William Doherty, Guillermo Quitka, Jorge Oteropilos, Robert Gerard Pietrusco, George Senga, Julia Solis, and Yisuk Jung. I want to thank uh, the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies. And also, um, I want to thank the Roy Lichtenstein Artists in Residence Fund and the Mary Miss Resident and Visual Art Fund for their support. Bloomberg Connects permitted us to develop a new way of sharing our work on mobile devices. I hope you will all have a chance to check it out this evening. And I want to thank our communications director, Andrew Mitchell, for helping us take this technological next step, and his colleague, Christopher Howard, for the related website, which I invite you to keep your eye on. We will be posting new materials uh, over the course of the spring. There are many other people to thank, but I'm going to leave that honor to Lindsay. Before turning the podium over to her to manage tonight's opening conversation, however, I do want to give a little plug for another conversation that I will be leading on May 17th at 6 p.m. in this room between Claire Lyons, an incoming Academy resident and curator in the Department of Antiquities at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and Weber Ndoro, an archaeologist and the Director General of ICROM, our neighbor down the hill in Rome. And I conclude with my own heartfelt thanks to Lindsay Harris, our Andrew High School Arts Director, who jumped into this project midstream and took it in such fruitful, and may I say, Lindsay, generative, generative may I say that, generative <laughs> directions. The range of artists you see tonight and the breadth of conversation is in no small part due to her. Thank you, Lindsay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. That was very touching. Uh, it's been a great honor to work on this show with you, and thank you. As Elizabeth mentioned, I'm the Andrew High School Arts Director here at the Academy and co-curator of our present exhibition, Red Regeneration. This is a show that highlights a compulsion among contemporary artists to see, as things fall apart, an opportunity for renewal. The exhibition also represents the mission of the Academy to think across disciplines about phenomena that Rome brings into relief with particular acuity. It highlights as well what collaboration can make possible. And in addition to my co-curator Elizabeth Rodini, I would like to thank very deeply my arts programming colleagues, in particular Lexi Eberspacher, Laura Cabezas, and Anne Coulson, whose dedication has been instrumental to this exhibition's success. We are extremely fortunate tonight to welcome two artists in, the re in Regeneration to speak about their work with us, uh, Guillermo Cuitca and Sonia Clark. In some regards, their participation in this event is the result of serendipity. Guillermo is the Academy's Mary Miss Artist in Residence this year, an invitation that was extended well before the show was conceived. Sonia was the Academy's Virginia Commonwealth University Arts Affiliated Fellow in 2017, when I had the pleasure to meet her here, and I have followed her work ever since. When Elizabeth and I embarked on this project together, we swiftly saw that the distinctive styles of these artists presented a chance to think more deeply about decay and renewal, not only in art, but also in the built environment and in society. Only with their work as part of its foundation did the exhibition crystallize into the show that we are inaugurating today. Guillermo Cuitca is an artist who lives and works in Argentina when he is not showing his work worldwide. I'll give you an image that to me encapsula encapsulates the international renown that he has achieved as an artist. At his 2010 retrospective at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., where I first encountered the real breadth of his art, one gallery wall featured a mural-sized painting of an empty baggage claim carousel. Through Cuica's signature mix of dynamism and extreme control, 
The carousel swooped forward from its black ground as if it would surge right off the canvas. The painting for a moment transformed the gallery into an airport, a place that the artist clearly knew well from having shared his art with so many. From his first solo exhibition in Buenos Aires in 1974 at the age of 13, to exhibitions in the most prestigious museums worldwide, including, and this is just a fraction, the Museo Rufino Tamayo in Mexico City, the Pompidou and the Cartier Foundation for Contemporary Art in Paris, the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Wexner Center in Columbus, the Reina Sofia in Madrid, and I haven't even gotten us out of the 1990s. It is an honor, Guillermo, to welcome you to the Academy on this occasion after having admired your art for so long. Sonia Clark, a textile artist, is a professor of art at Amherst College. Previously, she was a distinguished research fellow and Commonwealth professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, where she served as chair of the Craft Material Studies Department from 2006 to 2017. Just before coming to the Academy for that uh, fellowship that I mentioned, she earned a university-wide Distinguished Scholars Award from VCU, uh, which recognized her commitment to that institution and to her teaching. Her MFA hails from Cranbrook Academy of Art, which also awarded her their Distinguished Alumni Award. And also, when she earned her BA from Amherst, they in turn honored her with an honorary doctorate in 2015. So I think we're getting uh, a rhythm here of how dedicated Sonia is to the institutions where her art flourishes, but where I think her students flourish as a result of her presence. Her art has been exhibited to great acclaim in over 350 museums and galleries in the Americas, Africa, Asia, Europe, and Australia. And the many accolades that she has earned, which include a United States Artist Fellowship, a Paulette Krasner Award, and an Anonymous Was a Woman Award, testify to Sonia's stalwart commitment to art as a means to unravel and see anew some of history's most painful episodes, uh, in particular the persistence of, ra persistence of racism and violence in the United States and elsewhere. Textiles, Sonia's principal medium, have played a key role in this history, as we will hear more this evening in the second part of our program, which will be followed by a short conversation that I will moderate between the two artists. But before that, I would like to welcome to the podium Guillermo Cuitca, who will discuss his art in light of regeneration. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. Um, Hey, that's supposed to see this. It's I was going to show this later, but it's like a curtain racing up. And the orchestra is tuning up. Okay. How do I start from the beginning? Here I am. Uh, good evening. And um, I, I thought I wanted to show uh, to you images and, and uh, didn't really write anything, but I know my work. We were just talking with Sonia and we said to each other, yeah, we know this. So we could, you know, I said to myself, you can, you can do it. And uh, so the notions that this show brought the Regeneration, fragmentation, I don't know, disintegration. It, it is present in my work. And I, and so I try to identify a few bodies of works that I think they're where I can find this, these notions. Um, this is a piece um, uh, from 91, 92. And, uh, and I'm not going to tell how I got here, but the important thing to me is that at some point I found myself painting maps on beds. Uh, this seems to be maybe an eccentric idea, but somehow to me when I did it, it felt completely natural. I almost thought that if I go to buy a mattress and the mattress has 
a map on the, on the mattress, I would say, well, it makes sense. And the sense for me is like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's probably the two extreme of, 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 a, of a type of, of space. Uh, one is very private and intimate, probably. There is nothing more intimate than a bed. And on the other side of the spectrum, there is a map, which is obviously a, a collective a collective space. But regardless that the bed is the place where we could think about dream, life, death, sex, it's, it's also a territory. So, so this idea that for me of combining the two was, was, was important. And, and I think the idea of that, that bring us, uh, bring this, this show and this piece together is, is how I regenerate the fragments of this piece. The, um, I organize um, this, this installations. There are two, one of, made out of 54 beds, the other of 20. And my, the first years I start to show this piece, they were all scattered beds. Uh, all each, uh, I have to say that there is not a sense of of, uh, I mean, geopolitically speaking, this makes no sense. This is a completely fragmentary world. There are maps from, uh, from areas, uh, and there are no maps from other areas. What I mean is like, this is not the UN, it's not like one continent, one bed, one country, one bed. It has nothing to do with that. So it's, there is a really arbitrary geo geopolitically speaking. And, uh, and my first inclination was to, you know, to to make these installations where people could walk through this, um, uh, this that now I see a drawing. So I, I, honestly, I, I haven't thought about it, but now with this this show, I think it it fits pretty well the the idea. Not only because the 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 the, the space seems uh, you know and all the the marble stones on the floor, and uh, but in a way, I I think it was a pretty. Uh, I was going to say, well, ruined world. And um, so this is to give you, a, this is a very dramatic close up uh, where you could see on one side there is a fragment of map of China and the other map of, 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 of uh, Germany. Um, the idea of, of, of this object was that I will show the bottoms of the, of the mattress where the big cities are, implying a sort of trip uh, or yeah, like, yeah, it makes sense graphically that, that you had, you know, you, you go from here to there and, and there to there. But I didn't want it to, uh, to, to create the, the regular patterns that normally mattress have. So, so I really wanted to, to do something that it was more, that somehow is, is where there is a real dialogue between the map and the bed. So, so that's why I, and, I, and so that's, that's how they, you could see how, how it's, is be made and and also when I like it is sometimes when a road um, started in one place. This this is a little fragment from Sardinia, and the other one is is a map from, is a little fragment from Mexico. But I like the idea that one road can start it in one place and continue in another, which again geopolitically has nothing nothing to do. So at some point, I thought that this were needed um, a different configuration. That was probably the last time that I that I, I showed this this bed in a in a larger space, but all you know, all, all scatter around. And um, and just this is uh, uh, an excur an excursus, I think. Um, by the time I you know, my, my work is sometimes happening in several fields, even pictorial, pictorial fields, but different ones. So you could see here uh, a fragment of, of a painting, which is, doesn't intend to be a depiction of the installation, but you could see how influenced by that is. So in a way, the, the accumulation of beds. Also here is chairs, microphones, and a, a complete mess, and, uh, and also a, a very theatrical sense. I'll, I'll show you another fragment of this piece and 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 the complete uh, work, which is a, a very large painting. Um, so let me go back to where I was. So at some point, I decided to 
And this is how I like it now, the piece is to make a compact configuration of this. So now this is the way that this piece live in this, in this format. Sometimes, um, you know, I, I manage to do a different volume, but, but this is how I, I regenerate this, this, this chaos. And uh, I mean, still, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very conflicted piece, but, but I like it, the geometry of, of it. And uh, so you could see another version of it. And this is an interesting outcome because I decided to create a padded cell, which makes sense. <laughs> That's the, the world we, 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 we're, we're living. And uh, I always was fascinated. And I think the idea of the mattresses, I, I even liked it because I always imagined that I wanted to create padded cells were, you know, the, this, this image of the, in, you know, I don't know, in, in psychiatry where, you know, people can crush their heads against the wall because they're padded. And uh, so I, 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 I create this, this, this cell. Um, let's see what is next. Um, talking about um, arbitrary T. Um, in, um, this is a wall piece, it's a, it's a mattress, and, and here I decided to take a really, what it looks like a completely Hispanic name, San Juan de la Cruz. I don't know if it's a fictional city or not, there might be a city called San Juan de la Cruz, but I don't know which one it is, and place it among a, a, a map of Poland. So, it's, so uh, um, uh, languagely speaking, it, it's a completely crash of, of, of two things, but not only that, it's also, the idea that one place, it's all the places. So in a way, it's a kind of nightmare because no matter which road you take, you always arrive to a city that is called in the same way. Actually, it is the same. It's funny that, that now in Rome, we, we have, I don't know the, how it's the same. In Spanish, it's todos los caminos conducen a Roma. All the, but the, the problem here is not that the, old, the, the, the roads go to Rome. They go, the roads don't exit Rome, so it's, so then then we have a problem. Not, not only that, that all get there, but we just don't have an exit. So I, I like it the idea not only to play with with the with the language, but also the idea of of this, yeah, this kind of a nightmare where, where you you know you just can't get out of where you where you are. This is a detail of of, of that. So many years later, and this is how I wanted to tell a little bit of the story of the, the, this integration, I retook the, the maps. This piece, those pieces were from the early 90s, and this is many years later. So you see how, how maps start to disintegrate. This almost looks like a, like a, like a, like a war zone or, or, or a, map of, a map that is in conflict within itself. And um, so the, the, the map is not any longer depicted with names so, so precise. So it's just start to get a little bit more, you know, more, more, more confused, I guess. And this is another painting from the same time and, uh, and where you could see a detail, which is start to be really a, a pulverization, fragmentation. How do you say like, like uh, yeah. So the, the territory start to, to be just, yeah, almost dust. I know that, that, that that's also an idea that, that runs through the show, and I like it to bring this image to, to you know, just to relay. These are almost crumbles of map, so something like that. And uh, years later, I, I keep working on maps. This is a much recent work, and you see this sort of a cubistoid uh, background, and uh, which in itself, in modern art history, Cubism could be understood as some kind of disintegration, reintegration in, 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 in many ways. But for me, what was more important in, in this body of work is that I, I decided to get rid completely of names of places. So I only have the graphic standards for roads, uh, just, you know, highways, little roads, big roads, but, and, and it was, a, I mean, it's, I don't think these works are abstract. For me, this still is a map. It's just that I, 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 I don't know, I felt a huge liberation to get rid of, of any information rather than, than the one that, that the, the map itself. Whether a map without name is maps, that's a different question, but I, I don't know. So this is a detail uh, of, of, 
of that painting. And uh, so there are many examples of that. These are two tiny paintings here, <laughs> a little bit huge, but they're just like this. And, um, and they're, uh, of course, you could see how free I was in, in making this, this work. So these are maybe even faster works. But I, again, this is probably where my, my sensibility is, 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 is now in regard to, to the maps. And this is just to, to close a little bit the, the the story with the maps. It's an interesting painting because I felt that not only the maps were, had no name, but also they have no territory. They almost left the territory. So in a way, you see this sort of a rock in the center, which implies a bit of a territory, but the roads goes beyond that. There is a, no use. So I, I think that there maybe was a further, was a step further to go, you know, just, you know, just let, let just, you know, let let let's get rid of, of 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 the of the of the of the territory and 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 play just with the with the, with the roads. So this is what what it closed the the maps. Do we still have time for? Sh yeah, sorry, I didn't. I wasn't. So let me go back to. This is related to the work. If I don't know if you see the show, but maybe if you saw it, there you'll see. It. There is um, something uh, related to this. This is, um, um, well, it says there, it's, it's, um, it's from L'Encyclopédie, which is, of course, this 18th century massive uh, project, and uh, which at that time it, at the, it's probably the ultimate project of the Age of Enlightenment, which somehow had the, the ambition to collect all possible knowledge. In a little section of that, it's many, many, many volumes. There is this called thing called Marrerie, and and it's just the ornament of of the of marble flooring plans, and uh, and I took some of those, and uh, and I I don't know, I was attracted to this, and uh, you'll see two two drawings here where obviously there might be an idea of destruction, but I I, I still think that. I don't know. I don't like to think in destructions. I think there are there is a sense of transformation, and um, and and, uh, and 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 this is a, a, a segment of the of a, of a sanctuary in in a, in a church. There's mostly mostly f French buildings, but actually there are other. Uh, I mean, there are other things as well. But the segment I took is was mostly French. And, and here's a painting we have on the show, which is in a way a transcription of a sort of a fragmentation, a disintegration of this, of this um, architectural plan. I haven't said that before, but architecture is, is a main, uh, you know, it's a main thing for me. It's, it's, it's something, it's, it's probably cartography and architecture is the main inspiration for the language that I use. In the work from, well, I don't know which it would be your right. It's an ink um, transcription, and and of course one it's it's harsh, the other one is liquid. But I I I, I didn't like that yet to completely liquefy the 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 plan. But use um, an ink. Uh, I tried many inks, and there is the ink that 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 the, it used to be in the cartridge of of the of the ink oh, in the ink um, in the printers. So, um, so I took it with a syringe, that ink, and, and it's a very heavy ink, and it doesn't flow, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't flow like a river. It, it almost goes in, in, in slow motion. And I liked it, the idea that, that this, this integration was liquid, but also, but we could still, either we arrived either too late or too early. So there is a sense of time also in, in the, in this, in, in the in the way that the, the ink runs through through the through the work. Um, normally, I, I I show this this work, implying the the monumentality of it by you know by by putting them in in in, in you know in, in a suite uh, or or in on a group. But I do like when they are separately because somehow you can concentrate it in in details. And uh, so I I think I'm I I'm I'm, I'm pleased to have. One of the works here, and uh, which which came from this this uh, th this exhibition. Um, anyway, um, um, 
the other inspiration was the theater. And I think even if I took those works from L'Encyclopédie, the main um, inspiration for me is it's, uh, it's the scene plans of theaters. The, um, and, and, and particular opera house, and within the opera house, the, the horseshoe opera houses, which I think they, they, they embody some kind of, of, uh, of, of very interesting society where all this, this thing with um, ex expensive tickets, uh, cheap tickets, um, you know, where, where are, of course, Italy knows a lot about that because most of, you know, probably battles were, were, were fought in, in within opera houses. Verdi knew something about that. And I like it very much, the idea that this is not a destroyed opera house, but somehow it's an opera house affected by the sound or by what is produced by the stage. So even in some of my work looks like a little bit like uh, theatrical. I like to rotate the idea that the drama is on the audience, not so much on the stage. Actually, I think there is more interesting drama on the, on the <laughs> audience. And, uh, and I want to show you a little bit of variations that, that I made with this opera houses um, in the, um, this is the plan of, of Covent Garden. I think I'm going to need some water. If, um, hold on a sec. And, um, you'll see, I normally I keep the, um, the I mean, I, I change uh, the, the colors that normally are, are for related to the prices of the, of the tickets. And, uh, and sometimes I digitally I, I manipulate that, but these works are not digital. This 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 is produced by by altering the photo, the coating of the photo paper, and that's what it creates all this all this mess. This is La Scala, where I think we were just talking about the Risorgimento. And this is a group where really, you know, well, it's out self-explanatory, so <laughs> I think. And so this is the image that probably I, I had it when I, I started. Let me run it to you again. Well, this was just, just an animation, and um, I can briefly explain that um, that the sound you hear is the tuning up of the orchestra and I think that um, what I like it is this again talking about this integration and dissolution is what happened in a theater house when the orchestra is tuning and the and somehow there is this sense of, of something's going to happen, but in order to that to happen, something needs to dissolve, something needs to disappear. So that's why I, I started to work on these plans. I'm not going to show that. It's, it's, a, it's a series of works that I did for curtains, actually for, for theater curtains, which I, I thought I will render the ceiling plan of the house. And, and that, that curtain will will match the, the, um, um, the tuning up of the orchestra. There will be the moment of the, of the curtain, which actually the curtain should disappear in order to have a performance. Otherwise, you, I, don't, I mean, no one goes there to, to see the curtain. And, uh, and also, like it very much the idea of the intermezzos, which I don't know if, if for me, the intermezzos had an echo of, of all the things we, we were we're talking today is, is, is time in between this this um, and so to to finish I, I did a little animation with a famous intermezzo by uh, from Cavalleria Rusticana and and uh, I think it's very beautiful <laughs> Okay.
Thank you very much. Thanks. Slowly, slowly, surely, surely. So first I want to thank all of you for gathering here. And I want to thank the people who are responsible for bringing us together as well. Um, you know, my name is Sonia Clark, and I want to share with you that I know this to be true, that we are all stardust. In the smallest fraction, we can find our essence and our roots. That we are stardust, um, that phrase itself is something that is attributed to Carl Sagan. But I would say that humans have looked to the sky and known its inherent vastness as a freedom and a guide to who we are and where we are. So I was quite jet lagged yesterday and I have no idea what I said to anybody. <laughs> but when I was going on my orientation, I've been here a few times, but when I was going on my orientation, um, someone who was there as well, Brooke, said something that reminded me of something I knew about this place and this space. Tomorrow, April 14th, marks the 411th, birth, um, year, 411th anniversary. I was naming all the other kinds of anniversaries, birthdays. Um, so 411 years ago, on this site, just a little bit that way, in what is the Academy's Casa Rustica, Galileo first demonstrated his new invention and named that invention in that time, but in this place, the telescope. And telescope, of course, means something that allows you to see far, so far seeing and near being. And it was in the spring, though I cannot tell you the date, about t exactly 200 years ago, that a star was born. And her name was Araminta Ross, um, who many of you know as Harriet Tubman, herself an astronomer, who used her knowledge of the sky to navigate back black folks towards their rightful freedom. And still, we seek those freedoms. I know this to be true. <laughs> I know that a textile is a text, a story, both words, text and textile, come from the Latin texere, meaning to weave. And I also know that a flag has its own powerful vernacular. And as poet John Agard writes, what is that fluttering in the breeze? It's just a piece of cloth that brings a nation to its knees. What's that unfurling from a pole? It's just a piece of cloth that makes the guts of men grow bold. I like the near rhyme of that second part. <laughs> anyway, um, here the contentious Confederate flag used by white supremacists whose very existence requires the subjugation of others in order for their survival. Used by the KKK and other white terrorist groups, there's no doubt to me that this flag must be picked apart and made to dust. So in 2015, um, I uh, was living in Richmond, Virginia, the seat of the Confederacy. And it was 150 years um, that we were celebrating the end of the Civil War. And so I set about doing this project. 
Then, at that time, moment in time, we were a nation, both with the first black president, and we were also reeling from the ongoing legacy of lynching that manifests itself in the murders of black people, and we tried to name them all, but our mouths overflowed with the endlessness of the bloodshed. We were reckoning with the deep injustice woven into the fabric of this nation, and so a deconstruction was required. I had people stand next to me in pairs that those of you who are art people will recognize that that is Lowry Sims in the top left, top right. Um, but strangers, as well as people I knew, would stand next to me. I would explain to them the structure of cloth, and we would go about unraveling it together, and then the next person would come. After each person, I would hug them, strangers and friends alike. We were working together to metaphorically dismantle systemic racism through this contentious symbol of racial terror. Just days after the first performance, I actually strangely found myself in Rome, and, um, and people were calling me from NPR because in the news, Dylan Roof, his hateful mass murder had happened, and because he was photographed with a Confederate flag, um, big box stores and other people vowed not to sell the Confederate flags anymore. And I thought about how even if they all disappeared, that is to say the symbol, the cloth is a monument of sorts. And of course they didn't all disappear. Um, what was revealed is another piece that is called Unraveled. And my studio assistants and I took one of the Confederate battle flags just down to its threads to turn it to dust. When I work with other people, it takes, um, usually the performance lasts two or three hours. We get no more than an inch of the flag done. I made this piece that's in our show. Thank, thank you. <laughs> it's in our show. Um, during the Trump presidency, an era in which white supremacy reemerged as a vile beast that it has always been. And I think as you titled this conversation together, uh, Lindsay, uh, the things that fall apart, that of course made me think of Chinua Achebe. And he has this quote in Things Fall Apart that says, quote, he has put a knife on the things that held us together and we have fallen apart, unquote. So this piece is quite small. It two cheap, small parade flags Seemingly inconsequential, small, but powerful propaganda, powerful problematic. Problematic monuments in multiples, each made from printed cotton, one a US flag, one a Confederate flag, their weft threads removed and then woven together, but not completely. Now that's just how we got to this point. But really it's from this point that the piece speaks. Is a democracy coming apart? Or is it constantly being rewoven with systemic re oppression? Will the two ever be undone from one another? And I ask this question in a real way. You know, I put this question on my Twitter account, um, which I don't spend a lot of time in, because like a lot of artists, we tend to spend our time on Instagram. But, um, <laughs> and I, I realized that I just pinned it there because of the news, the daily news. And so back to Italy for a moment. I want you to consider this connection between Garibaldi and Lincoln, you know. So in 1861, Garibaldi is trying to bring this Italy into a nation. And Lincoln, 1861, is when the um, Civil War began. So I think about this kind of destruction and reconstruction, especially at the end of the Civil War, and to consider that in reconstruction and the idea of um, reparations, that the only people who got reparations at the end of the Civil War were those who were the enslavers. African Americans who regained part of their freedom were left to fend for themselves. 
because the enemies of the state had lost their pop property, um, they were given funds. And I think about the kid gloves through which um, those who were partook in the insurrection have been handled. And so I really appreciate and thank the curators for placing this work next to Bin Don's piece about the Vietnam War. I believe there is power in dust, the dust we collect and who gets to collect it. Who's in charge of the archive? Who gets, what gets preserved and who gets to tell the story of those objects? So I was in um, the American History Museum many years ago, and um, it was around, I'm from DC, so I was home, and it was around July 4th, so usually I'm not on the mall around July 4th. <laughs> but I was there this time because I was doing research. And everyone was lined up to see the Star Spangled Banner, which has its own room and is quite large. And I went upstairs to see this exhibition, and in this exhibition was this top hat. Anyone want to wager a guess whose top hat that is? Lincoln's, you, you all know, you can't do this wrong. You know, I'm not grading you, everybody's doing all right. Everybody's getting an A. Um, Lincoln's top hat. And next to it was this half piece of a dish towel that I had never seen before. And I would assume that many of you have not seen it before. And that half piece of a dish towel is half of the cloth that ended the Civil War. And I asked myself, why don't I know that symbol? And yet I know the symbol of the Confederate battle flag so very well. So who gets to tell the story and how? So I decided that I would tell a little bit of a story. I made a reproduction. I made the cloth whole. That's what you see on the left. And then I made monumental, which is to make the original dishcloth. Um, I should say they couldn't find a pure white cloth. That's why it has these three red stripes. I'm grateful for that because then it has a de design element. It's also a waffle weave, which lets you know, like many of your dishcloths right now are a waffle weave so they can absorb water, right? So it's really a functional cloth that got repurposed to end the Civil War, moving from domestic space to battle space. Um, and I decided to make it monumental, so the piece monumental you see here. Um, and just so you understand its scale, there's my friend Nami, who works at the Fabric Workshop and Museum, who helped um, uh, make this piece. Um, Nami is not very, very small. <laughs> the piece is very, very large. And I'm proud to say that it's recently been acquired by the Smithsonian, and it will be in an exhibit that opens next month. So any of you who are heading back to the States or in DC, please go see it. I believe in the power of gathered up dust. So this piece, edifice and mortar, of course, an edifice can be a definition defined as a large and imposing building, but it's also a complex system of beliefs. The mortar in this piece is a gathering of dust, that is to say, the gathering of hair from black salons and barbershops in Richmond, Virginia, keeping in mind that Richmond, Virginia was the second largest port of human trafficking and the height of the global enterprise that was the transatlantic enslavement trade. This hair holds the DNA of our forebears. The US empire, like the Roman empire, was built on slave labor. And I keep that, I hold that in my mind when I enjoy my time in Italy and also when I'm in my home country. Now, of course, US, the US differs from Rome in that um, its enslavement was inherently racist. So black people in this sense, um, the hair, the dust from those um, salons and barbershops are the mortar that once held under the weight of the system and also holding it together. And I'm thinking about Nicole Hannah Jones's uh, The 1619 Project in which she says, white Americans in both the North and the South came to see slavery as a necessary evil, the only way to pay off their debts and build a new nation. But by the eve of the Civil War, the Mississippi Valley itself was home to more millionaires per capita than anywhere else in the United States. 
So each brick on this upside down flag, I hope you read it as an upside down flag, has words from the foundational document, the edifice, so to speak, created for the maintenance of white patriarchal power. That is to say, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and yet what is self-evident is a structural racism that is um, prevalent. To further draw a line between Rome and the US as empires, the back of the piece is inspired by the connections between um, slave-made bricks in ancient Rome. This one that you see in the top left is from 2 AD. And the slaves, um, the um, brick trade from the Antebellum South in the US. Um, you can see the crescent shape of the, um, of the brick stamp from Rome. Um, of course, I read that as an Afro. How could I not? Um, and then in my Maker's Mark, I play on the word schiavo and chow, which um, share the etymology, but it's not even that. They're actually the same word. Um, I would imagine there are enough Italian speakers in here that you know that the word schiavo means slave, and the word chow is a friendly greeting. So when we say chow to one another, we are in fact saying, I am yours, I am your slave. This is a kind of monument in a way as well, a kind of recognition on our tongues that this place and that place um, were built on slavery. So when you remove chow from schiavo, Right? You end up with SHV, which literally stands for shareholder value. Sometimes the art just makes itself. <laughs> and of course, all of this is in a liberation afro in the manner of um, Angela Davis. Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist who escaped from being enslaved, said, quote, even in slavery, a hair story is also a self-invention story in the face of oppression. I believe in the power of dust. For this performance reversals, I considered the elevation of that white dishcloth to become the Confederate surrender flag and used to broker peace. And as a strategy of reversal, I used a dishcloth readily available with a ubiquitous Confederate flag um, to clean a floor made dirty with dust. When I cleaned, Again, the Declaration of Independence was made evidence. It is actually dirty text, so, but it's fused in, um, in glue. So I cleaned away the dust, and then this dirty text would be revealed. But getting the dust was not easy to come by. Join me on this, for this little journey. So the Fabric Workshop and Museum says, we will get some dust for you, some curators. This is all taking place in Philadelphia, perfect for the Declaration of Independence work. Um, we will get some dust for you. We will talk to our fellow curators or all these museums around here that have to do with the Declaration of Independence. Curator cur to curator, no trouble getting dust. And then a museum director heard that there was an artist that wanted to use the dust that they were going to throw away. And they told me I couldn't have the dust. So that means dust has power. In any case, we worked it out. And um, Independence Hall and Declaration House provided us the dust for this piece. And the other museum shall remain unnamed. So I washed this floor to reveal the words we revere, but we're dirty from the beginning. <laughs> because one of the things that we know to be self-evident is that in this country, all men of every race, all women of every race, all non-binary people of every race, and when I say this country, I'm, we're in the American Academy, so you know I mean the US, <laughs> are, are while created equal, while all beings of stardust, do not hold the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness still to this day. The text is written back and forth like warp on a warp on a, I'm sorry, like the weft on a loom, a pathway of the fabric of our nation. I attempted to create tension by centering the work as dressed as uh, someone, a domestic, cleaning up the mess of this nation. I was dressed specifically as Ella Watson, and if that name is not familiar to you, um, it should be now. Ella Watson is a person that Gordon Parks made famous in this piece. 
And so I wanted to make a monument to her, so when the performance was over, um, the garment that's a reproduction of the dress that she has on in Gordon Parks' famous American Gothic, the bucket, and the dish rag printed um, with the Confederate flag that had been used, stay there. As I am performing, I'm getting down on one knee and cleaning the floor to conjure Colin Kaepernick's um, activism as well. I was thinking about this text and textile connection, um, that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and how that relates to the idea of how text written that way, booster fade in text, is like the path of the, that word literally means the path of the cow, that is to say, the animal that is yoked. And of course, the word yoke itself shares a, an etymology with the word subjugation. I believe that etymology is to words as we are to stardust, their sum and substance. Among the troubling unexpected monuments I count are those that live on in our language, like I shared with you, this connection between the word um, chow and schiavo. I made this piece lingua franca, and it's not a performance, but I'm showing you me installing it. Um, with a friend of mine, uh, Nick Benson, who is a MacArthur Fellow and a stone carver. I figured if I was going to get someone to do stone carving, why not pick a genius? Um, and I asked him to pick a beautiful piece of Carrera marble to signify Italy and Rome and to inscribe it with the word schiavo and then save the marble dust for me. And so I even think about the etymology of the word marble, that its literal etymology means a shining stone, and of course our association with it, signaling certain kinds of authority, wealth, monument, stature. And even the classical symbols idealized and built on the myth, the myth of whiteness as testimony to the importance of form, now debunked with all this evidence that those classical sculptures were painted. Um, as well. When I made this piece with Nick, I thought, okay, so it's not just language, there's more than language that's at play here. I started thinking about the power of the Roman alphabet and how it is used, a quick calculation that so shows that about 2.6 billion people, so that's about 40% of the world's population, use the Roman alphabet. And I want you to ask yourselves why. It makes sense that the Roman alphabet would hold maybe the language I'm speaking to you in, certainly Italian and other Romance languages. But it itself becomes this symbol of, uh, of oppression, a tool that erased other scripts and also potentially other ways of thinking. I'm thinking about Ngugi Wa Tiango, who wrote the Decolonizing the Mind, that seminal text, in which he says, quote, language as culture is the collective memory bank of a people's experience in history. I think of a strand of hair in the same way, that it functions as a genetic record of ancestry and collective memory of not only who we are, but all those who came before us to make who we are. In Ngugi Watiango's book, he said, and I should mention, if you don't know who Ngugi Watiango is, he wrote in his native language, Kikiyo, and for doing that, he was imprisoned in Kenya. In writing, the, in decolonizing the mind, he petitions other African writers to write in their native tongue. And when they do, and those books go to print, they are printed in the Roman alphabet. So still to get to your native tongue, you have to pass through the Roman alphabet. So I came up with a correct, oh, I want to say one thing about this map. So you see that there, on the continent of Africa, there is all this green. All the green is um, the Roman alphabet. And there is blue where um, Arabic is used. Arab, of course, another colonizer of sorts. But you see the brown, the brown is Ethiopia, the one place that was not colonized, that still holds on to its own script. I believe hair is script and language, and I don't mean that metaphorically. It's the language of freedom and beauty. Yes, this is my hair from my Afro pick, but it is also subs a substance that might easily get overlooked 
or discarded, and it holds power. Often the edges do. My work often recenters that which has been marginalized, and I hope you can see this as language. That um, the hair is our DNA, all those amino acids curl tightly and holding who we are. And so I made this script. Oops, looks like we skipped over one. Let's get back. We made this script. Um, it's called Twist. Um, I worked, it's a digital script. Um, I worked with Bo Peng, um, a graphic designer, to make it based on the curl pattern of my hair, but standing in really for African hair. Um, it was, um, it also lives old school like this in the hot lead type. Um, and all of that was inspired by this original object, um, which is called writer type pen and sword because Remington provided guns for the Civil War and then also made typewriters. Um, Twist is named by Rita Dove. When in doubt, ask a brilliant poet to name your font. She did that. I think of it as a kind of freedom. Um, Julie Moretu, who I had the pleasure of spending time with when I was here not, uh, in 2019, talks about Mark making as a kind of liberation, and I too think of it as a kind of freedom. And I leave you with this. We are all stardust. I think about how we're connected to the stars, their light rays tethered to our retinas. We are bonded to them. So here's a reverse constellation, black on white, like ink on a page. And if you stare at these hairballs, it won't work this way, but imagine. If you stare at these hairballs, and you let the presence of Africa in, <laughs> let the inner and outer universe merge, when you close your eyes, that after effect that's burned into your retina is a constellation made from these hairballs. That DNA, again, of tightly coiled, tightly coiled to in each hair, signals and centers the African continent as a cradle of humanity. Let this be a reminder that even in this place, and now I am referring to Italy, filled with a lot of whitened Madonnas, we are in fact all children of Africa and we are all stardust. Thank you. <laughs>